In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt saw war coming with Hitler's Germany, even as he reconciled the isolationism of American politics with his own internationalist instinct. Today's guest tells the story of FDR's personal reliance on his hand-picked ambassadors to Europe in the critical years before America's entry into World War II. He's Ambassador David McCain this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. And I'm G. Wayne Miller with the Providence Journal. This week, we're joined by David McCain, the former U.S. ambassador to Luxembourg. He's also an accomplished author whose most recent book is Watching Darkness Fall, FDR, His Ambassadors, and the Rise of Adolf Hitler. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you, Jim, and uh, I'm delighted to be with you uh, today. I'm looking forward to it. Well, congratulations on dark, uh, on watching Darkness Falls. I, I, I finished it this weekend. It's really an important uh, piece of work. Give our audience a quick overview of the book itself. Sure. Well, um, you know, this is really the story of diplomacy during the U.S. diplomacy during the 1930s, and um, what I decided to do was to really do a group biography. So I picked four ambassadors in Europe. Um, and obviously this doesn't encompass all of uh, President Roosevelt's foreign policy during this period, but four ambassadors in Europe who um, I thought were critical to our foreign policy at that time and really sort of traced their, uh, their time and the kind of advice that they were giving to President Roosevelt during this period. And uh, it's a it's a it's a mixed bag, as I uh, as I say in the introduction. Uh, these are this is a problematic but very interesting group of individuals, and there's also a supporting cast as well. Uh, there's obviously sec- the Secretary of State, who at the time was Cordell Hull, um, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, who was in many ways the the president's political conscience, um, Under Secretary of State um, Sumner Wells, who was just a brilliant uh, individual and close to the Roosevelt family, and finally Harry Hopkins. Um, who became, in many ways, his most trusted advisor. But the four ambassadors, just very quickly, were William Dodd, who um, was the ambassador to Germany, Breckenridge Long, the ambassador to Italy, um, William Bullitt, who was our first ambassador to the Soviet Union, and then uh, later ambassador to France, and finally, uh, uh, someone who many people are familiar with, Joseph P. Kennedy, who was the ambassador to the United Kingdom. Now, we're going to talk about each of them in a little bit of detail, but you know, having been a U.S. ambassador yourself in the Obama administration, I'm curious, as a starting point, what do most Americans not appreciate about the role of an ambassador today, and how does that differ from the role that these men played in the 1930s? So it's a very good question. Um, let me start with sort of the, the second part of that question, which is that uh, you know, in the 1930s, this is before the internet, it's before, before Zoom, it's before, uh, really before television. Um, and we were in many ways isolated. And you have to remember that we were only a little more than a decade away from the First World War. And at the time, there was really no overarching view of American foreign policy, and so that we were somewhat isolated. Uh, And there was very much a a feeling in the country that we wanted to remain isolated, that the United States needed, uh, obviously we were in the middle, in the midst of the Great Depression in in 1932 when when Roosevelt was was elected. So it was a a critical time. But the ambassadors for President Roosevelt were really his eyes and ears at the time. And in many ways, Franklin Roosevelt was his own Secretary of State. So he relied on these individuals. And this is not something that would happen today, but he had, you know, he had phone calls with them. He wrote them directly and they wrote to him directly. Um, he read their cables. So he was very involved um, in what the ambassadors were doing. And whenever they were, were in Washington, they went to see him. Um, again, this is not something that you would really see today. Um, today's ambassadors, you know, I think um, we 
are present in, in uh, 200 and um, something, you know, countries uh, with ambassadors and consuls uh, around the world. So uh, it's a vast, vast uh, network that we have at the State Department these days. And the role of an ambassador today, it has, it has some similarities um, because it's very important for the ambassador to be um, communicating what American foreign policy is, and in some instances to be uh, implementing that policy. But um, I, you know, in my view, the sort of most important quality that an ambassador can have is to have the virtue of being a good listener, because you do want to know what's happening in the country, and you do want to convey that back to Washington D.C. and to uh, um, to the uh, assistant secretary and uh, assistant secretaries at the Department of State. So, in 1933, uh, the United States was reeling economically and politically from the Great Depression. What role did foreign policy play early in the Roosevelt administration? Well, you know, Franklin Roosevelt uh, came to office and he actually uh, had somewhat of a familiarity with Europe, at least. He had been an assistant secretary uh, of the Navy and um, he'd traveled to Europe many times as a, as a, as a boy and a young man. So he knew Europe well. Um, but foreign policy pl played really no role in the uh, in the campaign of 1932 when when Roosevelt defeated Herbert Hoover. Um, Roosevelt really didn't mention foreign policy, and um, the only thing he really uh, uh, did was he he came out against um, the uh, the Treaty of Versailles because. Uh, um, he believed that at the time it was important for the United States not to be involved. I mean, it was really this uh, this feeling that goes back to George Washington, no entangling alliances. And so um, he was convinced that it was important for the United States to say to stay as far away from foreign policy as as possible. Now, the one thing that he did believe was that there were um, a lot of reparations that were owed to the United States as a result of World War One. And so he wanted his ambassadors to essentially be sort of a collection agency <laughs> to, uh, to make sure that those countries that they were posted to paid their bills uh, to the United States. And he also was somebody who believed in free trade. And he felt that um, if trade could help again to ameliorate some of the economic distress in the United States, then it was very, very important. But uh, the, the general feeling was that the United States should, should stay out of the internal affairs of other countries. So Roosevelt and Dodd, who was his ambassador to Germany, were aware of Nazi persecution of Jewish populations in Germany. Can you tell us when they became aware of that and, and what their reaction was and how much they knew? Sure. <clears throat> so it's, it's, you know, it's an interesting history here. Um, one of the things that I write about was that there was a very detailed um, Article, article in the Atlantic Magazine uh, in 1932, 1933, about the rise of Hitler and about what was happening in Germany. So Hitler was a known quantity at the time. Um, and when, but when Dodd went to, uh, to Germany, I mean, a little bit of background on Dodd because I think it's important. He was from a small town in North Carolina. He'd been educated at Virginia Tech. He was, um, he'd lived for a year in Germany, so he spoke German. Um, but he really had no diplomatic background. He had no political background. He was at the University of Chicago and was chairman of the history department there and knew somebody in Roosevelt's cabinet. And the president um, was trying to find a really seasoned individual, a seasoned diplomat, um, a statesman to take the job of ambassador, but he couldn't, <laughs> you know, he couldn't find, he, he, four people turned him down. So eventually, he uh, this uh, cabinet official um, suggested Dodd, and Roosevelt had met him and said, "Well, that sounds fine to me," and so he nominated him. And Dodd went to Germany with a with an open mind, um, and had hoped to, I think, um, you know, to to live up to what Roosevelt described as sort of a liberal model, of uh, of um, being a uh, someone who would espouse uh, dem democratic values. But he quickly saw what was happening, um, even though uh, Hitler was not yet, did not yet have the full reins of power, uh, the Nazis were um, 
very prevalent on the streets of, of uh, many cities in Germany, and they were um, they were they were brutal. They were um, roughing up uh, anybody who was uh, opposed them, um, and uh, so he slowly became aware that um, there was a movement in Germany that was very contrary to those democratic values that he and Roosevelt had discussed in their initial meeting. And he became aware, I think, probably in 1934, that after Hitler became the chancellor, that um, they were establishing um, work camps uh, around Germany. Roosevelt also became aware of this. But again, um, you know, relating back to your earlier question, he was preoccupied with what was going on in the United States. And so while he, um, and, and again, his, his foreign policy was that you should not become involved in the internal affairs of another country. You know, the, so much of that history feels heavy with what the, the what ifs of history. If, if the West had more forcefully confronted Hitler, one of the other uh, challenges facing the United States at the time was the uh, was German rearmament. The Versailles Treaty had capped the German <laughs> army at 100,000 troops. When did Roosevelt and his ambassadors become aware of German uh, rearmament, and what did they do about it? So, uh, actually, Dodd became aware of that quite early in his tenure in Germany, and um, you know this was a this was a was a priority for Roosevelt from the beginning that uh, the nations of Europe needed to um, to maintain neutrality that they should not rearm that you know there should never again be the kind of war that that there that had existed uh, in in the Great War as it's known and um, when millions of of people were killed um, so it was early um, I think that uh, Roosevelt however you know, was somewhat powerless to do anything about it because he was <clears throat> he was forced to work with a um, a Senate that again had wanted nothing to do with um, with foreign policy. The American people, um, I think, would have agreed with him or did agree with him on the issue of, of rearmament, but there was no there, there was no sort of groundswell about this issue. And so that while his, amb his ambassadors, um, not only Dodd, but others as well, tried to convince the, uh, um, the Europeans to make this a priority, uh, it was, uh, they, they found it very, very difficult. And, and Hitler you know, completely ignored um, the Treaty of Versailles and um, began to rearm. Now the alarm, the alarm bell was sounded, but um, it didn't stop anything. So at the start of the Roosevelt administration, the United States had not formally recognized the Soviet Union, but it did so in November of 1933. Walk us through that. Why? Yeah. Why and how? Sure. So, uh, you know, again, this is this uh, his ambassador, the, uh, the man that uh, Roosevelt appointed to be the first ambassador to the Soviet Union was a man named William Bullitt, who was a very charismatic, interesting, um, intelligent uh, individual. Well, he's a real character in this book and uh, somebody who I didn't know a lot about. He actually negotiated um, with uh, Vladimir Lenin in uh, 1919 um, in Paris during the peace talks. And so he was very familiar with, with, with the Soviet Union. And, Roosevelt uh, met with with Bullitt and immediately was attracted to him, liked him very, very much. Um, and Bullitt felt that it was important for the United States to have relations with the Soviet Union. And again, Roosevelt felt that there might be opportunities here in terms of reparations and in terms of, of trade. And he recognized that that, uh, you know, communist Soviet Union was not uh, was antithetical to everything that uh, the United States stood for, but I think he felt that in the end um, we needed to have relations with as many countries as possible, and that perhaps again that some good could come of the relationship. Um, and Bullitt was very persuasive and and very optimistic in the beginning, but uh, when he arrived in the Soviet Union in 1933. Um, you know, he he had a terrific meeting with uh, with Stalin, which I recount. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of drinking of vodka, 
Uh, and, uh, but it was sort of downhill after that. And within a year, um, he felt that he was powerless to get anything done, that he wasn't, he didn't have access to the hierarchy of the Communist Party. He was being followed, his, his uh, phone lines were being tapped, and he wanted out. And um, so that relationship deteriorated very quickly. One of the things that struck me, whether you're talking about uh, uh, Bullitt's first interaction with Stalin, Dodd's first interaction with Hitler, or Breckenridge Long's initial views of Mussolini, there seemed to be, they were, it's not that they were enamored, but they were taken by this, this, this first introduction to these leaders. What, what do you think was going on in, in those, each of those interactions? So that's a, you know, that's an interesting question. I think, I think, you know, as an ambassador, you, again, you go to, you, when you're posted in a country, um, the first inclination is that you want to uh, get off on a good foot, that you, you know, you want to, you want to listen, you want to be, um, uh, you want to have access to people in the government. Um, but you also have to go into these meetings with your eyes open. Um, Look, Bullitt didn't know Stalin particularly. He'd never he'd never met the man before. Um, he had, a, as I say, a very sort of uh, interesting first encounter with him. It was again sort of a raucous dinner where there, a lot of the communist hierarchy was there. Um, and I think uh, I think he thought he might be able to you know to make some uh, headway with uh, with the communists. Um, a little bit different with with Bullet. I mean, excuse me, with Long. Um, Long was sort of I would describe him as somebody who was easily impressed by money and power. Frankly, um, he uh, thought that Mussolini, after his first meeting, he called him a man of of of, of astounding character. And uh, you know, Mussolini sort of had this kind of grand office that the two men sat in, and uh, he was a consummate flatterer. And uh, Long liked being flattered. And uh, he had a beautiful house in Rome, um, Long did, a beautiful residence. So I think he thought the situation was pretty, you know, pretty good. Um, he was not somebody who, in the end, as I say in the book, I think ever should have been appointed ambassador. In fact, he never should have been in the Roosevelt administration. He was, um, he was not, in the end, a, uh, a very, uh, very good, very good fellow. You know, Dodd, um, Dodd again was somebody who uh, I think in the initially was uh, was trying to make a good impression with with the German government and thought perhaps that uh, he could have some influence there if he uh, you know if he um, just talked to them and had and used sort of moral suasion. But he actually pretty quickly understood that Hitler was uh, uh, was not going to be somebody that the United States could work with and. Within a year, you know, he basically said that uh, he was not going to, in any way, participate in any official government functions where any of the Nazi hierarchy were there. And uh, by 1937, he would he had called them all, uh, you know, a bunch of murderers, which in fact they were. Your book describes the evolving assessment of Adolf Hitler by Roosevelt and his closest advisors. Can you give us an overview of that evolution, where it began? and where it netted out later in, in uh, his presidency. Sure. Well, again, I think, you know, I think Roosevelt, um, initially, he, he didn't really give a lot of thought to Hitler. Um, in fact, he sent w William Bullitt early on and on a mission to, um, to Europe, and B uh, Bullitt went to Germany and talked to somebody who knew that he knew there who was very plugged in um, to the government and to the media. And this individual told Bullitt, you know, he, he told him very sort of surreptitiously, he said, Hitler, he said, he's, you know, he's a small time house painter um, who's managed to, to um, enthrall crowds politically, but he's basically a flash in the pan. And uh, Bullitt uh, relayed this information to Hitler, um, I mean, excuse me, to, uh, to Roosevelt. Um, and I think Roosevelt um, sort of tucked it away but uh, he knew that uh, events were devolving in, uh, in Germany pretty quickly. And um, he's certainly getting information from Dodd in 1934, 1935, 1936, um, that the situation was getting worse and worse. And so he 
he was very aware that um, that that uh, Hitler was rearming. He was very aware uh, by 1937 that um, Hitler was uh, sending his political opponents and and uh, German Jews to concentration camps, and um, he certainly knew um, by 1938 with the Munich Accord that. Uh, you know, that Hitler was someone who um, was bent on war with other nations of Europe. Um, again, this was something that Dodd was telling him at this point. Um, Bullitt was telling him this, that war was inevitable. Uh, and actually, even uh, Breckenridge Long felt that war was inevitable at this point. So how did Roosevelt respond to the inevitability of war, which, of course, was the correct prediction? Yeah. Again, you know, I think you've always got to keep in mind, and the way I sort of think about Roosevelt is that this is a, a president, and it's not unlike other presidents, but Roosevelt was perhaps more a master of this than others, and he certainly had bigger challenges, I think, than most presidents. He, he, and again, you had the Great Depression, where 25% of the country was unemployed, where GDP had fallen to uh, levels uh, 30 years earlier, and when he came into office, you know, there were banks closing every day. And so he had to essentially um, just uh, triage on so many levels domestically. And he was also very politically um, aware of what was happening. And he was very politically aware of where the, of where the country was in terms of foreign policy. So it wasn't really until 1935 that he says, he gives, he says a speech, in a speech he says, you know, I'm frankly more worried about what's happening abroad in Europe than I am what's happening domestically. And by that time, he had actually passed a lot of very, very important legislation on the domestic level and things were beginning to slowly turn around. Um, so he was making progress, but things were devolving in, in, uh, in Europe. And so, uh, you know, after uh, Munich, um, William Bullitt tells him, listen, you have got to rearm the United States. And at that time, the United States really had, you know, had no um, military uh, at all. So no army, um, had a, uh, a weak Navy and um, not much of an Air Force to speak of. And Bullitt correctly advised the president that when, if war came to Europe, that the, the, uh, an air war would be, uh, would be extremely important and that he needed to vastly increase the production of airplanes. And he says at one point, you know, you need to have a, have a, a million man army because um, in a year or two, you won't regret it. And did, David, you, David, you, uh, the fourth ambassador that you, that you chronicle in this book is, uh, Joseph P. Kennedy. And this is in some respects, the most absurd, the most, uh, fraught, the most complicated relationship that, that, uh, that Roosevelt had with his ambassadors, particularly because Kennedy seemed to be defeatist in the face of, uh, German, uh, aggression. Talk to us a little bit about that relationship. So let me just so first say, you know, defeatist is exactly the right word. Um, it wasn't that Rose, that uh, Kennedy admired Hitler. He actually thought Hitler was a, you know, was an evil man. But he felt that the United States just should not be involved in any war in Europe, and that we ought to find out that we ought to reach some sort of accommodation with with uh, with Hitler. Um, so they, in the end, he became an appeaser. But but it really was because he not because he liked Hitler or admired him. You know, I think Breckenridge Long, on the other, on the other hand, there were, there were indications that he actually admired some things that, that Hitler did, which is uh, appalling. Um, so, you know, Kennedy uh, had served, they'd known each other, first of all, Kennedy and Roosevelt had known each other a long time. And um, Kennedy had supported him in 1932. He had come to Washington and served as the first uh, Commissioner of the Security and Exchange Commission. He'd done a terrific job. Uh, he wanted to be, uh, you know, in the uh, the, uh, um, the uh, Secretary of the Treasury, and Roosevelt refused to appoint him to that. And after um, Kennedy resigned from the SEC, Roosevelt then appointed him as head of the Maritime Commission, which was in some ways a demotion. But Kennedy was loyal, and he actually did a good job at the Maritime Commission as well. And then ultimately, he decided he wanted an ambassadorship to the court of St. James. And Roosevelt, again, was, as I mentioned earlier, was an extremely political guy. 
And he thought not a bad idea in 1938 to put Kennedy into um, in, in England. Uh, number one, it'll keep him out of the political um, the, the political scene and the, and the potential for Roosevelt to run for a third term in 1940. And number two, you know, Kennedy was an aggressive and, uh, and spoke his mind and he thought maybe he'll shake up the British government because Roosevelt actually did not have a high opinion of the British government. Now, as that relationship progressed and during the time that, that Kennedy became, uh, that Kennedy was the ambassador, Roosevelt undercut him at every, at every point and Kennedy made a number of very um, ill-advised uh, mistakes of his own, um, ill-advised moves of his own. He, he talked to the press and he tried to make foreign policy. And that was something that, was, uh, that Roosevelt was not going to stand for. We got about literally about 25 seconds left here, David. Uh, this is not your first foray into the uh, Roosevelt era. Uh, why does this era still fascinate Americans so much? Well, I think because it, it is an era that, you know, so much was on the line. I mean, uh, you know, not only was our economy in, a, in, a, in shambles when Roosevelt took office, but our democracy was literally, our way of life was, was threatened by, um, by uh, both Germany and Japan. So it was, a, it was a, an incredible period. And we need, you know, thank God we had a leader like Roosevelt. Um, he was not a man without flaws. <clears throat> But this was a man who was very empathetic, um, but at the same time, very unsentimental. He was very pragmatic, but he was also very idealistic. Um, you know, I think he was, the, he was the man for the moment. Well, the book is fascinating. It's Watching Darkness Fall. He's Ambassador David McCain. David, thank you so much for being with us. That is all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can always find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. <laughs>